teapot, and uh, we uh, uh, got disfranchised with the uh, growth of the island, yeah. and it'd make me mad every morning when I'd go pick up the paper mm -hmm. and look down on the horizon and see that monstrosity of loggerhead K <laughs> sitting on the horizon, and it'd make me yeah. mad. I'd stay mad all day. Yeah. I said, there ain't no romance in that, so <laughs> we went out to Buckingham and found us a place, yeah. mm -hmm. a perfect place. Big old barrel pits on one side of us and, and behind us, and the cemetery across the street, and uh, uh, a, uh, a pair of school teachers living next door to us. So we had no trouble with the uh, uh, residents in the neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. And we're market gardening there. Oh, uh, yeah. Can I hook a mic on you? You can hook a mic on me. Yes. That know. way I can pick up some of this good information you have. <laughs> the the um, the light, mm -hmm. and I was hoping that uh, the Coast Guard would give us that, and that would go along with what Sam has been able to acquire the prism, mm -hmm. and hopefully we could display that in the museum. That's why I'd like to get up inside yeah. and see what we've see got if it, there. How how can that be moved? I don't know yet. That's mm -hmm. why I wanted to figure out what that cylinder is. Oh shoot! But you know something could maybe be taken out that door through the top and then lowered over the Lord, side uh -huh. the uh, pulleys. I doubt seriously whether they're going to put us on. It's going to electrify. Uh, yeah, you're right, it should have been. But the proposal, uh, we just used a sun valve on them. And when it went like this, it would come on. Uh, yeah, no, no, it won't come on. It's a real dark. Uh, yeah, the only thing I can say is we can wait. out here with a bulldozer and knock them down. <laughs> the only, only back up to the 60s, they were used as dwelling for the right. light attendants right. who service the uh, lights from Captiva. They mm -hmm. The uh, ones from Ga Gasparilla worked the lights down to Captiva. Mm -hmm. And from here, we took care of the lights to Captiva and up to the lock, right. up the river and over to Fort Myers Beach. And this was just dwelling for the personnel that were uh, doing that work. And as, an, uh, as a, one of our duties was to maintain and service San Jose Lock. Right. We had to keep the land uh, clean every day and put the curtains up every uh, morning, take them right. down every evening. Now it's uh, automated and they don't right. put the curtains up. So right. that was just. It's one of the duties that the old lighthouse service right. required of the personnel. Yep. When we were stationed here, it was kind of a transition between the uh, old lighthouse service and the Coast Guard. search and rescue with, right. uh, uh, say, Pete. Mm -hmm. So, in 30 years, you, you have a, a big uh, change. We, in this kind of weather, we'd be chipping these, uh, the steel under the buildings here yep. and keeping it red-leaded and yep. painted. And that was, we kept a continuous uh, maintenance of the buildings and the structure. And as I say, one year, we, uh, it took a whole year, but we, the personnel did the light in fair weather. We didn't work at it steady, but we worked, we set staging up at the top and just worked all the way around and then lowered it down one uh, level and then worked around again. Yep. And we had to 
maintain a radio watch. Right. And uh, make routine radio checks to, to either St. Pete or Miami or Key West. Right. Oh yeah, he's no, he's just well, he's just doing paperwork, or he's just probably listening to the radio. What is your first name? First name, Darren. Darren. Double R E N. Another thing we used to always do is my wife was. Uh, always kept track of the small boats going in and out, the rental boats especially from the beach, and we'd uh, keep track of who, how many had gone out. And when these summer squalls would come up, we'd say, well, still one boat out, hmm. and we'd jump in the jeep and go up, and we'd usually find them between here and uh, the rocks up there, yeah. where they'd come in on the beach. Yeah. We'd uh, secure their boat, take them over so they could get to the ferry. But we'd always check before the last ferry, because there was no place on the island for them to stay. They well, he said that he just wanted some to take the tonight on the come on here. So it's when they could stay here. Right, yeah, an officer charge. And, uh, the, uh, The A's navigation on the picture here is like, we just happen to have a key to it. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yes, what, two balls or four balls? Or do you, I don't know if you're up there. I don't know, they've never been up there. But I understand it has a 300 millimeter land, so that's about all I know about it. They reduced it to the fall line. When it went out, it, the fact that it wasn't flashing uh, on a regular uh, on cycle woke her up. I went up to the lights and checked it. The burner, which was acetylene, was still warm. So it had not been out more than just a, a couple of minutes by the time I got up. That's just how conditioned we got. How many, how many years did you do that? Well, we were here as keepers for... Underneath the lighthouse, um, lighthouse keeper's quarters. The cistern. The metal pilings that uh, supposedly are all linked together underground, which makes this um, whole complex very secure, very stable. A set of uh, batteries oh. in there for standby, so that if the landline goes out, uh, then automatically the batteries will take over. But it's very expensive to maintain a set of batteries. Now, like these big buoys out there, they have batteries in them that would have to be changed every six months or so. Now lighthouses all have a characteristic and they prefer that characteristic as a well it's it's an identification. This light flashes uh, half a second on, one and a half seconds off, 
half second on and then seven and a half seconds off. So it gives you a flash of two every uh, 10 seconds. Other lights will have uh, a different uh, sequences and different uh, intervals so that you can, uh, coming in from offshore, you see a light, you can uh, say, well, now that's Sanibel light. There's Gasparilla light by its characteristic, just like the buoys. They don't have them all flashing the same. They have uh, one color for one side and another color for the other side. And then they have white. They use, they use uh, a slow flashing light, in other words, one every four seconds, for uh, something like uh, just a regular run to stay in the channel. But when you come to a, a turn or something like that, they have a uh, uh, quick flashing light to show a place you were supposed to exercise caution or if there was a turn or something. Or if it was a, a, a fairway buoy that you could go on either side of, it would be a short long so that you could go either side of it. And they have different characteristics for different uh, things like that. And they paint them different colors to identify them. They, they, uh, like a fairway buoy would usually be black and white. And a wreck buoy would be uh, red and black. And once we couldn't stay in the houses, then we could abandon and go up in the tower. But we never did have to do that. So you would, you would go in there to keep it going? or just As for our fire protection, it was automatic at that time. In other words, it was, it was operating, and we did not have to go up to wind the lens or anything like that. Now, in one hurricane, I think it was in uh, 1947. Here, one second. I have a video here. There is vegetation out here now. And there were coconut trees planted here that were higher than these uh, uh, dwellings. And in, I think it was the hurricane of 40, 47, uh, that uh, we had those, those, the storm came through and the water came under these houses so that it was uh, right up, uh, lapping up under the, these buildings here. And those coconut trees washed out and came bumping under the houses. Right here was a big 4,000 gallon water tank. See, we were dependent upon the uh, rain water for our uh, potable water. We caught the water off of the roofs. We had the, a downspout that came down and had a Y in it. Um, but we, I'm digressing, I know, but uh, uh, it had a Y in it, and we would keep it so that the first water would run out and just be wasted. Then as soon as the roofs, the salt rinsed off and the bird manure rinsed off the hooves, then we would switch uh, the flapper over and save that water. We saved it in, in this tank and the two tanks at the, by the kitchens. And we, uh, but we lost this tank and the big tower, which was here, to give us, uh, it had tanks up at the top that would pump the water up so we'd have pressure for our plumbing. And we used salt water for our uh, sanitary system and we had just the fresh water which was saved in these tanks we had uh, 14,000 gallons of water but when that storm was over we had one 4,000 gallon tank which is still there but uh, we had that storm come through and and when it was all done we had lost all of the beach area there were a set of steps like that they went to the front, they went right to the beach. The beach line came there. It came under that other house and went all around the point. And since now it's built back up, I've seen some old photographs that showed that there was about 20 acres of land between the lighthouse and the uh, beach in one of the, back in one of the early photographs. A postcard card. I never could get a hold of the postcard. It was uh, stored. It was uh, displayed down at the post office. But we we were prepared to abandon the quarters if we had to. But we never did. 
Now, we kept a, maintained a uh, watch of the weather. Uh, there was nothing we could do about a rescue, because all our boats were taken up to Tarkin Bay. Our jeep, we took up the island and put in a, uh, a safe place. And then when it was over, our jeep was brought back to us. Uh, and when the storm was over, this was, the sand had built up under this house so that you could not walk under the house. We had to get a bulldozer in and move some of this sand out. That uh, tower there had uh, sand piled up all around it. But it would come and go. But we, we always kept our cars under here. And we, we tried to keep the ground nice and neat. You see those big Australian pines there? We used to uh, uh, keep them trimmed and hedged to just about four or five feet and make them into a ball. We trim them several times a, a, in the summer. And the mosquitoes were so bad, you had to put on a leather jacket, a bee veil, and gloves when you were working out in, in uh, some areas of the place. They were so bad that uh, you could uh, swing a gallon bucket over your head three times and pour out six quarts of uh, dead mosquitoes. You figure that one out. But that, that right there at that water tank, one uh, night, my wife heard something buzzing, and it was, she couldn't see the water tank from the uh, window in the kitchen. She took the spray gun and the old-fashioned pump spray gun lit gun, and she gave two squirts uh, towards the tank. The next morning I came down and there was a windrow of uh, dead mosquitoes up against that tank that was a good 18 inches high and uh, the, all three or four feet long. That, that was just from two squirts with a uh, spray gun. She scared them to death. <laughs> but now they've uh, drained all, they've put all these ditches in and all them spraying. Not only have they uh, uh, killed off the mosquitoes, but I think they've killed off a lot of the wildlife. The, we used to have, uh, there were a couple of rattlesnakes between here and Pappy Shanahan's house that I'd see along the road uh, every, or oh, several times a year. They were about four to five inches in diameter and probably six foot long. But oh, nobody ever killed them. They just let them go because snakes killed the rats. And uh, it was a, a whole different life then. There were only about 50 families on the two islands of Sanibel and Captiva at, uh, when we first came out here. It was just one big happy family. Somebody had trouble, everybody pitched in and helped them. Uh, if we got a, a big catch of fish, somebody would uh, start cleaning them, and somebody else would uh, go up the island and say it's going to be a fish fry at the lighthouse. It would be just extemporaneous. We'd have uh, get-togethers like that. But somebody, and then some, somebody picks up some coleslaw, somebody picks up some potato salad, Somebody picks up some hush puppies. Somebody else would drag in the uh, um, grease from the last fish fry, and, and here we'd have a regular get together. While you've seen the light shine for a long time, do you hope to keep this, see it continue? Uh, yes. I, I don't come down to see it because we live in Buckingham now, and I don't come on this side of the village. Uh, uh, very often. In fact, this is the first time I've been out here on the island in several years. When you do come over this side of town, do you always keep an eye out to see if it's... Uh... Well, I, I don't come this far uh, down. But we, when we were stationed in, in Fort Myers, we used to uh, make a, a run down here at least once a week uh, with the car. And each one of us who was stationed there would say, well, I'm going to check the light tonight. In other words, we wouldn't both come down the same night, but we'd, we'd usually check it, and we had contacts at the beach that if anything happened to it, uh, that they would have notified us. 
And I understand at one time, back in the uh, 60s, that it went out and stayed out for about a week before uh, they were notified about it. Well, the only thing, I, last thing I need is, I need you to um, say who you are and when you operated this lighthouse, like I'm Bob and I operated the... Well, I'm, I'm uh, Bob England. At the time, my, my name was, or is still, uh, William R. England, Jr. I'm a junior, but my dad was the Bill, so I was the Bob. Everybody referred to me as the Bob. And we were here as lighthouse keepers from January 1946 to about uh, old March or April of uh, 49. At that time, they moved the personnel, Coast Guard personnel, from here to Fort Myers, and we went on to uh, our duties from there. And they did away with this as an attended uh, station. And in fact, while we were here, this was just dwelling for the uh, personnel. And at, as the storms were getting more frequent, hurricanes were getting more frequent, I believe the Coast Guard decided it was reasonable and feasible to uh, move the personnel off of the island. Because at that time, the uh, uh, beach or the waterfront was encroaching towards these buildings more and more. Over the years, we saw it come up so that the water was at the corner of this building one time. So the Coast Guard figured it was time to move us. Is there anything else? <laughs> or about you? We got any kind of program today? I'm waiting for the coast guard. Oh. Yeah, he was on government time last time. He had a driver <laughs> drive him. I couldn't believe that. I was just so it? I was so blown away by that. Uh, I just I, I, And what was his salary? Forty five thousand. <laughs> well I finally told him, you know, ask that other officer to keep his quarters. This the back of the front. Okay. Okay. That's the picture of the light bulb that was still on the couch inside. It's got pretty lens up there. It's a quartz bulb. Quartz bulb. Okay, and this is what do you call this? This mechanism? must have been the turning mechanism for the for the um, the beacon back in its earlier years. And we presently have the prison coming from the original. And we're working on trying to see if the Coast Guard will give us permission to also acquire this so that the lens may sit on it down at the historical museum. This is just in here because it was here, not because it serves any function. Right. It no longer serves it. Uh, I'm sure it is somehow. 
now, but yeah, I'll be sure this is a bolt no problem right there. It takes it off here, but this whole thing had to be dismantled. It'd be a real right. job for someone to do it, but I'm just looking to see there's bolts on here so the plates can come off. And then we could lower it down over the side using the uh, cantilevered. Some piece of firefighting equipment that. Uh... <laughs> I'm glad you came up first to get this door open. You know, I could feel, I could I feel the on, air. I could feel the air. I worked on that thing for five minutes trying to get it open. Yeah. And let's see. Now we'll look down and see how the people look like little ants. I like to imagine these kind of things. What kind of weather they've been through and all that. Kind of oh yes. Now somebody told me that uh, working down on quarters one. with the uh, pictures that we have from the top of the lighthouse. While you don't see any, or you see very few buildings, you see a completely different kind of vegetation. Um, instead of palmetto and mangrove, you see Australian pine. In his yeah. natural element, Bob England. Doesn't that breeze feel good? Yeah. Oh, thanks. He's a hundred pounds. Lighthouse leg, support system. And another one. And another one. Quarters two. Quarters one. And the light. Interview going on up there. You can see the uh, top of the crystal in there, coming down. And see the ports all the way down to the right.
standing on the beach. It's come and gone over the years in the five. This seems to be the classic view. Yeah, boy. Yeah, it's just as But we, we, we had allowed ourselves a week for house hunting. We met her at 1 o'clock and we were back on the planet at 4 o'clock. Just fine. Is it is it uh, doing it? Mm. Uh, is it talking? Well, you're talking. So you probably had it on you. Is it a little light that comes on? Tells you and I'm recording now. now. Yeah. I'm recording now. Okay. Well, 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 well introduce yourselves. I guess yeah. that's the first this step. Is, uh, Put your hand up. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm Bob England. We were former uh, lighthouse keepers at uh, Sanibel. We went there as when we were stationed in the Coast Guard in 1946. This is my wife, May. How do you do? <laughs> and our daughter was about three months old when we went out there. And our son was born while we were stationed out there. We were stationed at the light for, uh, from uh, about February, January or February of 1946 till the spring of 49. The Coast Guard used uh, the, the lighthouse at that time was an automatic light uh, in that the settling worked it. It had sun valves to cut it off at, in the daylight, and uh, the buildings were used as quarters for the Coast Guard personnel that were stationed in this area. At that time, there were three of us uh, assigned to the station, and our duties were uh, maintaining the light and serving as Coast Guard representatives cover the area up from uh, where we joined Boca Grande Lighthouse uh, all the way down to Key West and up uh, the uh, Caloosahatchee River to Okeechobee. Those were our primary uh, territories to cover and we were assigned to maintain the aids to navigation in that uh, area. Uh, we had a about 150 aids to navigation in our assigned area, about 23 lights, and we operated out of the uh, Sanibel Light Attendant Station, as it was called at that time, um, and did our work from there. Usually, there was one person at the lighthouse at all times, and the other two would be out working the aids to navigation, but when the weather was bad, we'd all be around the station and work on that, and we prided ourselves in trying to maintain the uh, station as nice and neat as we could. In fact, there was one man that, that would uh, come around uh, when somebody walked across the yard, 
he walk right behind them with a, a, a little broom and uh, sweep out their tracks. He was what just was so, so proud to like this station that much. The uh, big tall trees that are growing now from the uh, a lighthouse to the back bay, uh, at that time there was a, a sidewalk there and we kept those uh, Australian pines trimmed to about oh, four or five feet tall and hedged off so they looked like little uh, uh, ball uh, cedars or something. And we had a, a one, one pine and one coconut, one pine and one coconut. And we kept the sidewalk swept and trash picked off of it and, as it, and leaves and stuff like that. We just tried to maintain it, yeah, just like old lighthouses, the old reputation of lighthouses of being spotless. Mm -hmm. Who were the other men who uh, were with you? There was one, uh, uh, Jim, Garner. Jim Garner, and then there were several enginemen uh, I cannot remember their names. One of them was, was Brown. I don't remember his last name was Brown. Joe. Joe Brown. Joe, oh. Joe Brown. <laughs> from Sarasota. My name? From Sarasota. <laughs> he was, he, his home was in Sarasota. Great in And, uh, Most of the other people were, uh, not, um, uh, regular Coast Guard enlistees. They were drafted during the war and just oh. were serving out there. The number of years. The Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. They weren't career Coast Guard. Weren't, weren't career Coast Guard. And we'd have um, a, a young man that would stay there two, three months, and he'd be gone. So, so none of the others were married then. Yes, Garner. Oh, Garner, Garner had was his married. He, he was married to somebody from Fort Judy, Myers. Judy Cernsey. They lived over on uh, Edgewood, mm -hmm. close to the river. Mm -hmm. They were an old Fort Myers family. The and Garner name. The Garner name is from. He was from Oklahoma, and after he, he and she uh, divorced, and uh, after he served his time out, why well, he went back to Oklahoma, and she didn't like Oklahoma, so she came where I don't know. They had one child, Judy Ann, and um, that was the only lady that lived there by the time, but during the time that I was, mm -hmm. we were there. At least you had a little company then. Yeah, she, she, she and I both had these young kids, so yeah. we were pretty busy mm -hmm. with our own, mm -hmm. keeping up pretty good, but we used to go down on the beach with the children and yeah. then mm -hmm. play in the water and pick, pick up shells. We uh, sometimes had, of course, fish fries where the whole island would come down. Somebody called a mess of big mess of fish. Why well, we'd say, "Hey, let's have a fish fry," and everybody would come and we'd cook and eat yeah. out of the lighthouse. We we could not Biggest leave. We had to. Somebody had to be at the lighthouse at all times. Mm -hmm. That was uh, an unwritten law. So rather than Bob and me going and leaving the other people at the light, or they going and leave us at the light, why well, we had it at the light, so mm -hmm. everybody was yeah. happy. And another advantage of it was that there was usually a breeze mm -hmm. at the lighthouse point. The uh, in sunny weather or in inclement weather, we could get under the buildings and have mm -hmm. it there. Mm -hmm. And but the it was just something apparently that had been done down through the ages, even before we were there, when mm -hmm. the lighthouse keeper Shanahan and, mm -hmm. and Uncle Arthur mm -hmm. were yeah. in charge of it. Well, that was a a social place yeah, to meet, yeah. because that was before community association and the building was built. Yeah. And whenever we go up in the a tower, which we had to do twice a day, uh, you'd always uh, pause and look, and you could see from up there, you could see the schools of fish, and you knew right where to go, <laughs> so that when you wanted a mess of fish, uh, instead of wasting your time hunting all over the place for them, and unsuccessfully, you could uh, go right directly to where they were. And you'd know whether they were on the bay side or the gulf side or on the, near the point or up towards Shanahan's or if they were out on the a bar or if they were in uh, close. 
or up by Bailey's store, which but, way they were moving. Yes, mm -hmm. and they were so thick there. It's, uh, I remember one time I was. It was the first of uh, January. I was doing the annual reports, and uh, I was typing on them there, and I made came up on the porch and got her cast net and went down. So I went out to the front to see what she was doing. She made two casts, and I uh, then took a wheelbarrow down, and we put uh, 47 mullet uh, in the wheelbarrow. We and pulled out some of them. And uh, <laughs> threw a lot of them back, but we cleaned them and put them in the freezer. But we, it was at uh, the end of the row season, and they were pretty well rowed out. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that was one mistake that we made, because they were... They weren't fat. They weren't fat like they should have been. Mm -hmm. And we finally ended up by having to use them for uh, fertilizer. Well, a lot of them, some of them we could eat. But after they had been frozen a while, while they were just like boards. Mm -hmm. but, now, why don't you just go on and say what you were fertilizing, because I know well, you grew vegetables. My, my garden. We, we had a garden down uh, between the lighthouse and the boathouse, back in the bushes there. In fact, we had several garden spots. One of them was where uh, one of the Cuban fishing smacks, which, uh, well, at that time, the Cuban fishing smacks would come out of Cuba and spend several months up in this uh, Gulf area fishing, and they'd catch their fish, and they'd put them in the uh, uh, big live well. Instead of having a hold and, and icing them down or salting them down, they'd put them in this big uh, uh, live well, well mm -hmm. and uh, they'd keep them alive until they got back to Cuba, and then they'd beach their uh, smack and take the fish out and and process them. And they uh, ran into a set of uh, a bunch of red tide, and they, they got in there and killed all of their fish that they had. They had thousands of them in there. And they came in and to the, Coast Guard. to the Coast Guard station and asked us to verify that they had uh, so many, many fish. dead fish that so that they could get some re re reimbursement mm -hmm. from their uh, owners and get a share and not be uh, accused of uh, pirating the fish mm -hmm. off to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And so we gave them a note and they uh, dug a hole and buried those fish. That made the best broccoli you ever did see <laughs> about six months later. But there was, there was thousands of fish buried in there, and and that was the last year that we were at the lighthouse, because I remember as we'd go back to the lighthouse from Fort Myers, where we transferred to, uh, every week to, we'd come back to service the light. We mean in the Coast Guard, not the me. Coast Guard personnel, but we weekly come down and service the light, and every week we would uh, gather or harvest our broccoli <laughs> and we uh, take a load of broccoli back into the home with uh, uh, back to Fort Myers so, but that made wonderful uh, broccoli uh, greens broccoli cabbage collards tomatoes. and we grew peppers and onions tomatoes, tomatoes mm -hmm. and uh, but we didn't do too good with cucumbers but we they probably objected to the salt. The I salt. think they're very salt sensitive. But we, but we were just all the time we were in the service. We we'd always farm where the garden, even if we were only going to be there for a few months. Maybe whoever relieved us would benefit from it. That was just one of the mm -hmm. uh, things that the service personnel did it though in those days. We all because we were we didn't make a, a much money, and we had to stretch and make everything do. And uh, this being on lighthouses, you learn to this recycling the, that they're making a big to do about <laughs> nowadays. Uh, 
of uh, your recycling this, recycling that. We did that uh, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And you could you couldn't run down to the corner store and get a, a pipe fitting or a bolt or something. You learned to uh, do with what you had. Yeah. And on the islands, you learned more. And you at that you learn to plan well ahead because you couldn't always get just what you wanted when you wanted it. And we only rated one trip to the town, to Fort Myers, for the lighthouse personnel uh, a month, once, a, a, month once week. a week. And we'd rotate, they'd take turns at it. And whoever went in town would have to do the shopping for everybody, everybody. Yeah. not only the uh, people at the lighthouse, but we <laughs> would help uh, people up the island. They'd uh, say, get us this or get us that. <clears throat> and we, and when they'd be going in, they'd check with us and, and get stuff for us. So it was a big happy family back in those days. When we first went to the islands, there were only about 50 families on the islands of uh, Sanibel and Captiva. Now there's uh, probably uh, uh, 50 families uh, in just one part of one subdivision on one of the islands. I think it's um, 7,000 dwelling units. Mm. Of course, a lot of them are full. Yes. Yeah. But it's now, when you went into Fort Myers, you yes. said, and then you came back to the island? Yes. Can you uh, we, well, give uh, the base was we, moved to tell them where the base, the Coast Guard uh, base was moved off of the island. The hurricane in uh, 48, let's see, 46, 47, 48, 40, the hurricane in 48 did considerable uh, damage to the grounds and eroded the point. And in fact, it washed. Uh, the sand away from under the assistant keeper's house, which is the easternmost of the uh, dwellings there at the uh, lighthouse. Uh, it, the water came up under that house, and they had to get bulldozers in to move the sand. The sand piled up under the, the some of the houses and around the buildings uh, about four or five feet deep. And they had to move that sand around, and the Coast Guard was uh, figuring that uh, another good storm would uh, do more damage and would and it would endan endanger the uh, personnel. Mm -hmm. And so, as they were just using the lighthouse dwellings as uh, uh, barracks or quarters for the personnel. They uh, and and because of the liability and all, they uh, decided that they would move all the personnel from the island and put us on subsistence out of Fort Myers. It was because it was costing them so much and to maintain those buildings and, and all, and it was cost efficient to move us uh, and as a safety measure to move us. Then in they uh, let the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service have the buildings for a while, and City of Sanibel uh, has them, and first one uh, entity and another. And so far as the uh, buildings are concerned, the dwellings, they are of no uh, value to the Coast Guard, per se, and they, they would have no reason to maintain them. The only thing that the Coast Guard really w will maintain is the lighthouse structure itself and that area probably uh, 100 feet by 100 feet that the structure sets on. Mm -hmm. That is all that really the Coast Guard is interested in. Mm -hmm. Remember and the chief said as far as the Coast Guard was concerned, why they these buildings kept deteriorating, they just come in and bull bulldoze them down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in other words, if they just start to be a liability, <coughs> uh, they will, uh, they would more than likely, if no unit 
no group like a historical society or a city or something would want to take it over for a museum and maintain it, they would uh, just uh, destroy the buildings, per se, which I would hate to see. What do you mean, per se? They're going to build those them to the ground. There's no per se on yeah. that. <laughs> well, it's... Uh, <coughs> and if anybody is interested in those buildings, now is the time to start activities to get the, the use Control of them, of them before, before they, they uh, completely rot out. The mm -hmm. last time I was, when I was over there the other day, and I, the porches were in terrible shape, the buildings, the supports under the towers and all, uh, the, the lighthouse is in perfect shape, but the dwellings, mm -hmm. it uh, kind of got my heart to see how they had going to pop when we put, used to put so much energy into trying to maintain them. Uh, yeah. I think it's one of those cases where you've got too many people who think that they have a certain amount of control over it. The city has people living in there, um, but it's, it's federal government property. Uh, the Coast Guard doesn't want to maintain them, so the city asks the Coast Guard, can we please do it? And they don't reply or they don't help. Yeah, well, uh, and the, the Coast Guard is very the, limited. The, in the, city, the city has expect, you know, would like to we have the Coast Guard kick the, in. The lease, the, the city lease has expired. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't mm -hmm. been renewed. And it has not yeah. been renewed. Yeah. Oh. So but it's, it's somebody could write to the Coast Guard and tell them that they would be interested in using the building, not to the local Coast Guard. Coast Guard headquarters is for, or mm -hmm. to uh, district, district headquarters. Like in St. Petersburg or Miami? Miami. Miami. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if they want to, uh, now is the time for somebody to do it before the buildings get into such deterioration that they wouldn't be cost efficient to um, restore. restore. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, somebody has put new roof on there since we were there, they put siding on uh, where we used to keep that all painted. Was it and is it? It's clapboards. Mm -hmm. um, and all those uh, big supports under there, we kept them chipped and, mm -hmm. and, and painted. Now there's great big chunks of rust on there. Mm -hmm. And in a few years, they, they will uh, just rust eat out. Right through, and, eat right through, yeah. And mm -hmm. they they won't be possible to do anything with it. Mm. Well, you see, the paint was enamel, and it kept the, the moisture and the salt out of the metal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that wasn't just paint, paint. That was enamel. But if, going back to, uh, to the old lighthouse days, uh, May would keep track of the uh, people. There weren't too many uh, charter boats or uh, rental boats. Not people, uh, boats. The boat. She kept track of the boats that would go out in the daytime around the island, and and then she'd keep track of who came back. And if more boats went out than came back around, she'd let us know, and we'd usually uh, jump in the jeep and run up the island and find where they had had engine trouble or uh, hadn't realized uh, they swamped or they'd run out of gas or something, mm -hmm. and we could uh, get them back to the ferry so they could get off the island because that last ferry left at 5 o'clock. And if you didn't make that uh, ferry at 5 o'clock, you were stuck on the island in the mosquitoes because there were no uh, uh, facilities, hotels or motels uh, at some times of the year uh, that you could, you'd be stuck until 8.30 the next day. And we took a lot of people back to that last ferry, and we'd uh, call a, uh, we had the only telephone, we'd get word to the uh, uh, ferry mm -hmm. where the boat was so they could get re back to the rental people as to where they could find their boat the next day. And we'd help secure the boat so it wouldn't drift away. And there, uh, at that time, there were very few roads available. Periwinkle Way was there, but it was a washboard that you 
uh, went either uh, 15 or 50 miles an hour on. If you went 15 miles an hour, you went up and down over every bump. If you went 50 miles an hour, you would just touch the tops of the bumps and bounce from one to the other. There was no inter no uh, in between speed to travel that road, and most of us used the beach. You drive just above uh, between your uh, high tide line and or right at your high tide line. There was good firm uh, road, and you knew where to uh, cut off and go up in in inland, either Rabbit Road or uh, which Casa Bell Road or uh, uh, Tarpon Bay Road, uh, but you'd cut up in there and, and go in where you wanted to. In fact, the mail uh, route ran that a lot of it down the beach. And in the mail, uh, we had we were dependent upon the mail boat to bring the mail from. They left Fort Myers at eight o'clock in the morning. They got to Bailey's store at ten, and they went on up to Captiva spent a, uh, an hour or so up there, and then they came back and uh, uh, got to Bailey's store at 2, and then they got back into Fort Myers at 4. And that was our basic communication. And the mail would come on that uh, mail boat at 10 o'clock. And Pat Murk would, uh, usually was a carrier most of that time. He picked the mail up and take it to the uh, post office, and he and Scotia would sort it, and he'd uh, then take off on his rural route and run all around the island, get back to the post office, and they'd fix up the outgoing mail, and he'd take it back to the uh, mail boat and have it there at 2 o'clock. That's how many people there were on the island. They could take the uh, mail, sort it, deliver it, and get the outgoing mail ready and ready to go in four hours. So that spoke for the population of the island in those days. And when you were going um, along the beach uh, from the lighthouse on, on up, um, how'd you get across the Sanibel River? Sanibel uh, River goes down the middle of the island parallel to the beach, not cross. It didn't cross the beach down? Uh, yeah, 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 but it came out where the colony is now. Mm -hmm. It would break out there uh, just occasionally when it would flood. Most of the times it was closed, and there'd be sometimes as much as, as two years before Sanibel River would discharge uh, off the island uh, to uh, dump the uh, excess water. Uh, see, uh, the there was not the demand upon the water uh, at that time. Any water that fell on the island would uh, percolate into the freshwater lands and would uh, force salt water down. Then uh, people would use out of that little uh, fragile freshwater lands of water until uh, either it, salt water got into it uh, from being too thin or uh, until we got enough rain support to enlarge the lands. But there was not that demand upon it so that it was able to support and maintain the few families there were on the island. And the people that uh, drained on that uh, water, uh, on that lens of water, would have their uh, little pitcher pumps, or, or some few would have an electric pump, and you'd have uh, about three suction pipes. Uh, instead of taking a, a well point and drilling this uh, vertically like you would ordinarily do, you would go down, dig down, and lay a well point horizontally, and you would lay it, uh, you'd, you'd uh, put about three uh, points uh, down. You'd put one at about three or four feet under the ground, one at about five feet, and one at about six feet. And as when you start uh, getting salt into your water, you would cut that one off and go on to a, a higher one and draw on that uh, area of the water. Then when the rain would come, you would go to the deeper uh, suctions. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
us poor crackers and all, and we, we, didn't we, we, didn't have, with that. we didn't have to uh, worry with that. We had the cisterns at the but lighthouse. We, we, at the lighthouse, we had uh, three cisterns. There were two. And those big roofs put lots of water in. But uh, those cisterns, we had them arranged that uh, so that uh, the, the water came off of the roof into a, a downspout, and there'd be a Y in that downspout. And we'd have a flutter valve in that uh, uh, Y, and it would be cutting the water off from the cisterns uh, so that the first rain that fell would rinse the, the dirt and the uh, bird droppings off of the roof and we'd lose that little bit, and that was uh, whoever was at the lighthouse at the time that the rain the came would have to watch, and as soon as the water was clear, switch the uh, flapper valves so that we could uh, conserve and catch as much of the uh, rainwater as we could. Another and source of water was the deep well, the flowing well that was up at uh, Stoke Jake House. and Pearl Stokes House. Where was that? Uh, Let's see. You know where the bank is? Where, where um... Which bank? Oh. Dixie Beach. Um, the old okay. Bank. Okay. Dixie yeah. Beach. Yeah. Gordon Tracy's yeah. shop, right? Out on it, it, mm -hmm. the old Strokes house. Was back of where Gordon, Gordon Tracy's uh, shop and that, is. And that flowing well is probably still there. Mm -hmm. No, I think it got, uh, I think it got plugged. The city has plugged, plugged all, all the flowing yeah. mm -hmm. Speaking of the, where the Sanibel River uh, flooded out and went into over the beach, mm -hmm. it was very shallow there, so you could just go right through the water. Sometimes there was going to be a foot and a half water flowing there. It wasn't mm -hmm. something that was a huge thing. I mean, it wasn't like Blind Pass. No, it was just an overflow, mm -hmm. so that there wasn't any definite really what you would say river bed there. It mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. came up deep, but then see the the gulf kept throwing the sand back up into the mouth of it so that it, there was a, like a bridge across there. Mm -hmm. And then when it flooded, why it would cut through that sand mm -hmm. and go on down. And dump, dump for a little, a few it days and then it closed. Fill back up again. Go to the side B. Oh, what, you didn't tell her the neat thing that happened to us when we was at the Coast Guard at Santa Bell. Which one was that? That when uh, we got the pay raise. Oh, yeah. And Who's going to tell the story? <laughs> <laughs> when, when we first went there, uh, we were living in the quarters uh, rent-free. Mm -hmm. And You're getting all this, Betty. Yeah. Uh, I just got told that my battery is... And then way back against that island uh, that you uh, see is Fisherman's it, Key. Uh, well, I don't know whether it's Fisherman's Key or not, but it's uh, I think it is called Fisherman's Key. It's, it's the, the island, big island, big yeah. long island mm -hmm. over there. Well, you can see uh, the ground the, on. Right. Uh, there was yeah. a, uh, a tall tower, about 40 or 50 feet tall, mm -hmm. and in coming down in the main channel, coming from the sea buoy, you would line these two up so that uh, the rear range was right over the front range mm -hmm. and if uh, you drifted a little bit over and that uh, range opened up right. you'd know that you were out of the channel and you'd mm -hmm. bring them you'd come over to bring them yeah. get them back in line and then when you got up to this front range then you started you picked up some other lights further up the channel and you ran on them yeah. mm -hmm. and it was very shallow going to that back range, and that back range was uh, a favorite haunt of uh, a big osprey. Every year, uh, this pair of ospreys would build their, take the limbs and, and stuff and build them all up on that uh, tower. Build a nest. And build a nest, and I had to, we'd have to uh, move their, uh, occasionally they'd build so that it would be right in front of the light. Well, we had to move that, yeah. but as long as they uh, were building on the platform and not obscuring the light, we would leave them until they hatched out. And then after they uh, had raised their young'uns in there, we would then kick the uh, 
uh, nest down before an inspector saw it and <laughs> gave us the devil for letting the trash get on the light. Yeah. Yeah. But and we and another reason we didn't uh, discourage them is because that range structure was white and the birds roosting on it helped us uh, with the painting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Yeah. We didn't have to uh, uh, paint that as often as we did uh, the wash. black ones or the white <laughs> or the uh, red structure. Limed. Yeah. <laughs> you were talking about the Cuban fishermen and the fishing smack, and mm -hmm. uh, you had some visitors during oh, yeah. the hurricane. Well, and, and that was the hurricane of 47. 47. <laughs> year Bill was born. Yeah. He was born November the 9th and that was October the 27th and 28th. We had two. So you we were had, even we more than eight of We had two. We, had two. we, had, we <laughs> had two hurricanes that came down the uh, Caloosahatchee River and went out into the Gulf uh, that uh, within about a, a week of each other. The first one, uh, there were two fishing smacks anchored out off of Fort Myers Beach, and one of them wrecked, mm -hmm. and the other one uh, made it. But some of the people that were on the one that wrecked uh, made it to the other uh, fishing smack or came in on the beach and got with them. And then the second hurricane came, and they were scared, so they all left the second smack, the crews of both boats, and they came in and, and stayed the with survivors. us, the survivors from the one and the crew of the other. Because the a number of them were drowned. How, do you and have any idea how many? No, but it was written up in the papers. Uh, I think at least four or five. Mm -hmm. One yep. of them's buried right there where the causeway goes on to Sanibel. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Bailey came down. He was coroner or justice of the peace yeah. or something mm -hmm. and held an inquest. And Men from the ship buried him. And he was in such a con and we had no communication at that time with the mainland. Mm -hmm. He so deteriorated that he couldn't be moved, or he would have been taken to the cemetery. Yeah. But mm -hmm. the, the Cuban fisherman said no. You know right. that was good. Mm -hmm. And so th they stayed with us for the and they were with us in the lighthouse in the, at the lighthouse dwelling, truck dwelling mm -hmm. uh, in the second hurricane. And they were very nice, clean people. And the captain of the uh, one of, of, of the one that didn't uh, wreck uh, took charge of the whole group. And every morning at daylight, they were up. They scrubbed those floors. They rolled up their bedding and stacked it up and they took care of all their own cooking and uh, offered to do anything they could to help. Uh, they, and one of them was assigned that his job was to uh, babysit Margaret, who was 20 months old. And he was, that was his job, was to stay with her and keep her out of mischief and take care of her. And uh, then and the w steps uh, for the houses all washed away in that uh, hurricane and we had a, a ladder that we were going up and down uh, to the dwellings uh, to uh, and from the ground to, to go from the ground up there and those fishermen went out in the bushes and found those old the steps that washed away great big heavy steps and they carried them up there and put them back up to the house because the uh, well, senora, the senora needs to go to had the to get on the ground <laughs> and th that was there we we were waiting for the for some help to uh, one of the tenders to come in and help us with the heavy work but they went ahead and did it and, and helped us out that way but they, they were and then when they we got word to their owners, and they sent a tug up to get the uh, ship that was still anchored out there. And the telegraph. And, but see, the telegraph, uh, Bailey's store had the telegraph, and we had the telephone. 
they, there was a telephone. Uh, but our from, telephone was out. Our telephone was out because it, the, storm. the storm had washed it out over at Rasa. Uh -huh. Our part was good. But the tele they, they got word to back to their uh, uh, owners, and they sent a tug up to get them and sent money. Mr. Bailey advanced money, uh, advanced food for them uh, all the time that they were there. And when the tug came, they settled up with Mr. Bailey for it. And a, a Red Cross, we got word to Red Cross, and they sent some help out, but it was very limited. But Mr. Bailey and the folks on the island took care of those uh, fishermen. They, they, they didn't have much, but they, they scrounged around and got uh, clothing and bedding and, and stuff for them. And so they were there what, a couple of weeks, about a week or ten days, but not too long because the, like I say, Bill was born the 9th of November, and this is what the 25th and 26th or 27th of October, and they were gone before he was born. Mm -hmm. They um, how big were, were their sailing? Their sailing vessels were probably on uh, 70, 80 foot long. I've heard various sizes from 30 or 40 up to 125. Yeah. So. But I, I, I never was out to them. Mm -hmm. I just was the guessing one, from ones that I have seen in yeah. the past. Mm -hmm. The one that sank is out on that bar off of Fort Myers Beach, or was for years. Mm -hmm. And you could go in a boat and you could see it down there. Mm -hmm. Pretty well mashed up. I was sailing on Charles LaBeouf's boat one time, and we were going across that bar, and we came over. Uh, we thought it was a sucking ship. I bet yeah. that was that was all. We could have been, but yeah. there were several off there. Mm. And there's also that big metal water tank out there somewhere in the bay. See, that, mm -hmm. there were. We had two four thousand, five thousand gallon water tanks. There was one between the two structures between the two uh, dwellings, mm -hmm. uh, and it had a, a saddle there for it. Mm -hmm. But that, now that one, uh, the tank stayed there during the uh, 78 uh, hurricane. There was another one mounted over by the assistant the keeper's dwelling, which is the easternmost dwelling, mm -hmm. and that one washed away completely. We never did find that one. That one towards but the now the, there's yeah. still the, the old wooden one, at the keeper's dwelling is still there now. Hmm. Now originally the there were there was a, a, a one of those wooden cisterns at each house. Uh, but then the first the assistant keepers washed away and they replaced it with the a big steel one. And but that storm we ever fl flooded there. our, hmm. our uh, 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 the salted all the water. Hmm. We had to drain all the water out of the uh, cisterns and the buoy tender came and brought us uh, fresh water. And we, before it got here, well, we took the water cart. We had a water cart. We had up, a 300 gallon stokes, water. Up the Stokes and got water out of there. Well, mm -hmm. not only for us, several people got water from them with our water cart, didn't they? Yes, we, we, we let the water cart out and mm -hmm. people that needed water went and got the I think you went with it yeah. to fit the Jeep. The yeah, the Jeep was the only thing it could pull that uh, that water yeah. cart. It had a hitch that only, and that was the only uh, thing that had a hitch that would fit that. We, uh, before we were there in the big hurricane that they had before, was it the 38 hurricane? It washed out the keys and everything? Yeah. And the people went 35. up. 35. Yeah. People went up in the lighthouse tower to escape from the Excuse high water. Please. I can't imagine that. Yeah. They did that in 44. I think yeah. Pearl Stokes uh, relates that. Yeah. Well, that was the year, that was the year before we were there mm -hmm. then, yeah. mm -hmm. apparently, yeah. because no one went in the tower when we were there. But uh, it must well, have been 34, not 44. No, I, the 44 I, hurricane, I think it was. I think it was, but 
I don't remember the year, but we could tell probably from the number of children that she had that went up with them. <laughs> well, she, uh, and, and also some Cubans she from Smacks. Any, she didn't have any children after we moved there. Bobby was about hmm, four, maybe four or five years old. Three, mm -hmm. four. By the way, he's in New Orleans now selling automobiles. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and Lamar, which was the older boy, mm -hmm. is in, uh, does Crystal Beach ring a ear, ring a... Crystal River? No, no. Mm -hmm. Destin is where it is, up near Pensacola. Okay. Okay, and um. he's, he's doing ceramics. He and his wife and son have this big ceramic business they huh. sell all over the United States hmm. I think hmm. but um, they have you know these yeah. electric kills and everything right. and yeah. Pearl is up there mm -hmm. it's Navari N-E-V-A-R-R-E -E -E, Navari okay. is where she lives I, yes the 15th which is day before yesterday, or yeah. yesterday mm -hmm. was her Beautiful. birthday oh really yeah mm -hmm. and I sent her a birthday card so <laughs> That's how I remember Navarre real easily. <laughs> and Virginia, which was the younger daughter, is, uh, was married to a local boy, and mm -hmm. they're no longer married, but she uh, has her second husband now. Pearl calls him a nice little Yankee. <laughs> <laughs> Pearl did a video that tape. sounds like Pearl, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. That's good. Of course, Virginia's children are grown, too. That's how kids age you. Yeah. You know, we'd all stay the same, but kids get older. Oh, yeah, <laughs> these kids get older, like they having these great-grandkids. Yeah. <laughs> My grandkids having great-grandkids, I think. Hard Sheesh. to believe. <laughs> <laughs> when, when you moved off the island yeah. and then came back again 10 or 12 years later, there were a lot of changes. I mean, they paved the roads yeah. and they dug the canals. Oh, and, let me know. give you a little tale yeah. on the I mean, uh, little like dissertation upon paving the roads. Okay. Um, when we first went to the island, the, the, the only hard road was uh, the area was from the ferry landing up to Maybe. Uh, the where the standard station. Well, I think it's Amoco Station now. Yeah, I and uh, think so. but it was a standard station then, which was at Bailey Road. Mm -hmm. It was a little narrow piece of road. There was just one vehicle wide that had been built during WPA days. Mm -hmm. They uh, built it. Uh, they had WPA money, and the uh, local people working in WPA uh, used uh, the sand and shell that was on the island, right in place, and they barged a tar over and had the uh, tar barge anchored uh, down at the end of uh, Bailey Road, and uh, they hauled that tar up in wagons, and uh, uh, they mixed that with the sand and shell and compacted it with the uh, uh, Tampers, and that was the, the road. Uh, then WPA folded up, and uh, the uh, war came along, and the money was uh, stayed in the county uh, treasury, and the county commissioners used it. The county commissioner that covered Sanibel I was also the county commissioner for Pine Island and what is now Cape Carl. And uh, he uh, used the money that was in that uh, district of funds to improve the roads on Pine Island, which was the spoils of the game. Mm -hmm. uh, I was informed, uh, kind of left-handedly, uh, that uh, money was uh, still uh, available in the uh, county uh, funds, but was being uh, just borrowed here and borrowed there. And so a 
talked to several of the people on the island. We uh, got a delegation together and went to the commissioners and requested that some roads be improved on Santa. Well, we haven't got any money. I said, well, how about the money in uh, fund number such and such? They uh, said, they dug back in the books. Oh, yeah, it's there, but it's being used uh, here and there. I said, that fund was for uh, roads on Sanibel and Captiva. You built uh, so much road on Sanibel. You built the road from Blind Pass to Captiva City on uh, Captiva, and there's still money available. Well, sure is. We'll have to uh, use it there. Where do you want it? To, uh, what, what do you want? We say we want as much road as we can get. Well, we can build uh, uh, two miles of uh, four-lane road uh, continuing on towards the uh, Tarpon Bay, or we can uh, uh, and give you about a mile. Or we can uh, give you about a, an eight-foot road all the way to Tarpon Bay. We said, uh, give us the road to Tarpon Bay. So they uh, agreed to surface down to where Bailey's store is now, at uh, Tarpon Bay Road. Mm -hmm. And then we said, and then in future years, you can ex extend it on up to join uh, Captiva and that became Sanibel Captiva Road. But we, uh, if, we had, if the squeaking wheel mm -hmm. hadn't uh, squealed, mm -hmm. uh, the, that periwinkle wave would still be over on uh, Pine <laughs> Island. Uh, but when, when enough uh, boaters went into commissioners, the commissioners then would listen. That's the only time. <laughs> and just like when they uh, when they were uh, tearing up uh, Sanibel River. Some of the developers were digging Sanibel River. And we went to the commissioners and uh, uh, protesting the, uh, the uh, scalping of Sanibel Rivers. And they were trying to, to, in one of the developments, they were going to dig uh, their canals 40 and 50 feet deep so they could get the fill to uh, improve their uh, land. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, went into the commissioners fighting or complaining about that and requesting that the uh, Sanibel River be closed back up and so to not have the salt problem. And uh, one of the commissioners said, well, there must be something to it. The people on the island are complaining. We thought it was just one realtor uh, developer fighting, fighting another. And if it's hurting the uh, local people, we better do something about it. That was on a Wednesday. That Friday, they had uh, uh, at least filled the openings up where they had dug their ditches in there. And but it it ruined that. We we were uh, using surface water, and it it got so that it was salty. Not only for hours, but up as far as Pirate Playhouse. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Cipriani and. Uh, Birdie and then lived back in there, yeah. Yeah. and their wells salt were salted too. Hmm. I, I wouldn't mention any names, but you all probably know which developments I'm uh, yeah. referring mm -hmm. to. Yeah. Don't well, mention names. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't say the sundial because that's that's what it became yeah. later. Yeah. Well, then it Each was just year. a de development. It, it was just a development company at that time. Yeah. Talk about mosquitoes, too. Oh. I heard a story about your mosquitoes. Oh, that's my story. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you, you do know what I'm talking about when I say the cistern in the, in the mm -hmm. corner of the house between the kitchen right. and the house. Yeah. There's this big cistern. And there's a window right 12, 14 inches away from the, from the paint. Yeah. So I heard this humming, like buzz, buzz, buzz. I thought, what is that in the kitchen? I thought it was a wasp in the kitchen. And, and I went and looked, and I looked out at this water tank, and I couldn't see the tank. The mosquitoes were so thick between the screen and the water tank, all you could see was this black curtain of mosquitoes. So I went in and got the 
um, flit gun. Flit gun, yeah. And gave it a squirt, 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 too. And of course, they fell down. Mm -hmm. So I said to Bob, I killed a million mosquitoes. He said, oh. I said, if you don't believe it, look down there on the ground by the, by the foot of the cistern. And they had piled up in a little ramp about six inches wide and about six or eight inches up the side. Of course, it tapered off. Yeah. But there was this, like I said, a million <laughs> mosquitoes. But they just swarmed up in that yeah. corner. The breeze was such that it must have taken every one that was, had grown in that um, marsh right there next yeah. mm -hmm. and piled them up into that corner. That was remarkable. <laughs> we didn't have mosquito control at that time. Right. No. And the people who were nearest to mosquito control was that the county was uh, digging ditches so as to let the fish and minnows have a place to live to try to control the larva. Connect the ponds. Connected, kept the ponds connected and kept water standing all the time so the fish could stay there. So they live. So they live. And uh, we, uh, and then some others were trying experiments by uh, taking sawdust and soaking it with uh, burned cylinder oil and putting it out in the different parts of the swamp to try to uh, keep a sheen of oil to control it. They, they were trying all kinds of experiments. Mm -hmm. And none of them really worked. But uh, they, uh, they, you know, the, the road that goes around through the Ding Darling Sanctuary, that was originally uh, dug by uh, the mosquito control when they were digging those ditches and doing that draining to try to control the mosquitoes and they just get working it and they kept piling up the dirt made a dike made a dike yeah. so that, that flat would have water on it all the time and so they, go and they dry diked it, it in and they um, and they used their drag they used the fill to keep their drag line out of the water mm -hmm. and they just that uh, they started in that right there behind where the school is and made the loop and came out there where uh, Mitchell's uh, was. But that was the first dike for uh, the Ding Darling. And Colin Moore spent several years working with that drag line, yeah. putting that in there. Mm -hmm. But then there were several places down uh, between Dixie Beach and uh, the old Bailey store where Colin went in and dug a few canals in there. Mm. And he was very careful. Uh, they'd have it surveyed or laid out for him to dig a ditch uh, in a certain area to us from point to point. Mm -hmm. If he was going along and he saw what he thought was an Indian mound, uh, it would be hard digging there. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a, a conservationist. And he would find some excuse not to dig in those Indian mounds. He would uh, deliberately go around it. So he, he didn't, we, a lot of the people knew where those, where a lot of the Indian mounds were, but we didn't broadcast it because right. there were some people that abused them. Right. Well, there's one in the corner of that property we used to live at, yeah. there on Demory Lane, <laughs> alongside the, right alongside the river. That, rise like that. It's an Indian mound. We never dug in it. Yeah. We, what, well, you know what, Ray, you, really, you can know. tell which is an Indian mound? Yeah. It'd be gumbo Had limbo. the gumbo limbo trees growing <laughs> on it. Yeah. I think they planted them. Yeah. And they lived forever, I, I assume. Uh, I, the know? gumbo limbos were something in the Calusa uh, religion. Mm -hmm. Because every place. I think it was a medicine tree. Well, well any, any place. It was probably on, easy to carve. Any place, yeah. that, any place you find gumbo limbo trees, you can just, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, any size, not mm -hmm. ceiling. You can just bet that there's Indian relic, relics or artifacts in that area. And I think they used the sap from the tree, too, mm -hmm. as a medicine. 
Mm -hmm. you, had, you had <laughs> described um, going out and rescuing some people like that came out of Punaras and taking them back to Fort Myers Beach and, instead right. of taking them back to where they um, when when they they deliberately uh, yes. went out and, and knew they were going to run out of gas or something. Uh, that that that's the uh, teach them a lesson. That that that's the old way that you'd always do. Uh, that if you knew somebody was abusing mm -hmm. that uh, tow-in privilege, right. you would uh, not make an effort to uh, uh, meet their wishes to where they wanted to go. You would. Uh, you would inconvenience them slightly, but you have to do it kind of subtly. Mm -hmm. But we we tried to uh, uh, help people out as much as we could. Why would somebody deliberately get, get run out of gas? They they uh, stay longer than they should. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. There was one time there we. Uh, we would watch, May would watch the boats in the summertime, especially when these summer squalls would be coming up. Mm -hmm. And she'd let me know who was out. Uh, what boat? who, what boats were out. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was one time, there was about three of the uh, green boats, green, uh, the green boats that were fishing for kingfish uh, up off of about uh, the rocks. and. Squall came up and they ran to get in the back of, in the lee of Sanibal, mm -hmm. and they were going through that squash channel, which is a narrow channel, mm -hmm. close to the beach, that local people knew about, but it wasn't uh, charted, and it uh, was a shifting channel, and uh, they, these, uh, same, these uh, kingfish uh, boats, with their nets, they just had a little anchor, that when they saw a school of fish, they'd throw the anchor out and then try to circle the, the school of fish and then let the, uh, uh, they'd uh, let the fish uh, strike a nest and then they'd, when they got the nest full, they'd, they'd pick them up. But this one time, they had their nets on their uh, boats and they were running in and it got kind of rough and the anchor the, what they call a let go, uh, slipped off of the net, off the boat, off of the boat, and he was running on. The squall was coming up on him, so he just went ahead and ran on a, and to get in the lee of the island. When the squall passed, he came back to pick his net up, and he picked his net up, and uh, or started picking his net up. He got about half of it picked up, and he was about to swamp his own boat. So he had to call another Why boat. Why was he swamping his boat? He had so many fish. Okay. He was, he was, <laughs> his net was so loaded that uh, he, he couldn't put all of the fish in his net it in, wasn't just in his fish. one boat. It was so a pompano. He, oh. he uh, uh, Dollar bills. <laughs> You're right. He uh, uh, had to call another boat to help pick up the rest of his net. He gave, cut his net in half and handed it to the other boat, let them pick it up. And they took it into the uh, fish house, and it was two loads of pompano. Well, for weeks and months after that, they kept striking that uh, uh, swash, and I don't believe they got more than three or four catfish out of it uh, for their trouble. Just some freak accident. Uh, Weather those, for uh, uh, there. Those fish were the, running from the storm too. Yeah, mm -hmm. and ran into trouble. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Betty, you're running out of tape. Yeah, we're running out of time. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh. I I wanted to ask you though one thing. There's um, when when you were there in '46 to '49. I believe there was an old house where the standard station got built. Do you remember buildings there? No. Behind there were, it. There were build, behind buildings it. behind it. Behind it. But, but the one that Beach Gus, Road. The one that Gus Nix was living in in the early 70s. Who? The black man. Yes. The black, mm -hmm. the black people. Now that there. was behind there all the time. That, that didn't get moved then. 
No, the filling station faced uh, Periwinkle Way. Mm -hmm. the, the house in which you're talking about faced Beach Road. Right. And it was about, what, 50 to 75, 75 to 100 feet from the filling station. It was further back than that. Yeah, well, there, was was quite a, there was quite a distance mm -hmm. there. Like, mm -hmm. well, well, I guess Mr. Mr. Here. Staley owned them. Right. All, all, yeah, that, all, that, all that property up in there, yeah, right. and he could tell you what, what was where yeah, and, and when. There were a couple of, of buildings up there near that corner before they built the station. Like, that's why I was wondering whether they moved well, I that think one, down there. One, I think one of the things that was up up near that corner was a barn, mm -hmm. you know. For, okay. They had yeah, animals, they had mules and horses. And that was a stable and a barn. I was digging in that yard one time and turned up a bunch of um, shingles and, and stuff. So I bet yeah. it was from that barn. Yes. Well, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that, 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 if I remember correctly, that that was, wasn't the building that was in use. It was a dilapidated, run-down thing. And, mm -hmm. and it, it, if I remember correctly, it was a, a stable or a barn. And if you, if you think about it, wasn't there a wooden fence between the run along? By that color, people's houses. I think they up were. against up yeah. against the, the pepper bushes. Yeah, I think they were. Well, see, that was part of that corral for that those okay. horses and or mules, whichever they were. Probably mules, because I don't think Probably horses didn't. lasted very long on Santa. Now the mm -hmm. Nixus uh, had some horses, a time or two, mm -hmm. uh, up uh, around um, the rocks. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but they they did they weren't able to keep them more than about a year. Mm -hmm. Uh, because of the uh, insects, well, that they, they, they tried two or three different times mm -hmm. to have horses there. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Sally had a horse too, Jean Carr's wife. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she was uh, Miss Winterbottom's niece. Remember Sally? Um, I know that name, but I don't remember her last name. But she Carr. Had Jean Carr. Yeah, that's right. The Jean Carr worked at the Beehive. Same time I worked at the Big He was from Washington and he went back. He married uh, he married the hunter's daughter, Robin. Robin. You remember Robin? Mm -hmm. First time I ever saw her, she was riding a bicycle and her red hair was just flying in the breeze. <laughs> Boy, that's a pretty girl. <laughs> <laughs> well, another um, old building that might have been there on the other side of the street, on the north side of Periwinkle, uh, there was a warehouse that was also used as a residence that was evidently as a packing house and possibly was used as a school at one time, way back then. I don't, the only thing that was on the it north... It would have been fallen down in the 40s. The only, only thing that was there on the north side from Periwinkle Way and Bailey Road mm -hmm. uh, all the way down to the Bailey House, mm -hmm. there was nothing mm -hmm. in in that area there. Yet well, there were the cockroaches lived back out there. Now the cockroaches were gone all past the uh, Bailey House. Well, that is correct. You are right. Uh, see, the ba the cockroaches were back of where the bakery was. Okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, and then right across the street, and kind of diagonally across the street, and to the north. Uh, from the Bailey House is that was the what we call the Bailey House was the Fran Frank Bailey House. Mm -hmm. uh, Ernest's house was uh, kind of across the street and and it was kind of dilapidated. Ernest was Ernest Mr. Was Bailey's brother. Right. Frank Frank Bailey's brother, brother was right. Francis's uncle. Yeah. But I, uh, I never did uh, see much of uh, Ernest. He was, he pretty well stayed off to himself. He, he never, he was a partner in the store, but he was pretty reclusive. Mm -hmm. I think he wrote poetry. He was kind of studious. But you, you, mm -hmm. you were mentioning that. Uh, and go, but guys that wet themselves on television, hell, they're immortal! Hayden, what's
whether you realize it or not, you helped a lot of people this morning. This is a common problem, and nobody wants to talk about mm. it. I mean, if you were home watching TV and someone you respected, someone successful, charismatic, accomplished, came on and said that he had a low sperm count, wouldn't you feel better about yourself? And she's right, Coach. I'm proud of you. Yeah, not a way to go, Hayden. I mean, if I had this problem, I I'd feel a lot better about myself. I just thank God I don't have this problem. <laughs> You don't think you can catch it, do you? That's it. Lock the door. Lock the door. Why? Because we are never leaving this cabin again. Oh. Caden, this is crazy. Okay, you can go. I'm never leaving the cabin again. Come on. Hey, Christine, when this was our own private hell, I mean, it was bad enough, but now it's a great big public hell. <laughs> I mean, how's it gonna look? I'm walking down Main Street, people are looking at me, they're whispering, they're not talking out loud, but I know what they're saying. Oh, look, there goes Hayden Fox. He used to be a man. <laughs> so what if they do? And then the jokes are gonna start, Christine. They're gonna get real big ones like, hey, what's the difference between Hayden Fox and a short order cook? The cook can crack an egg. <laughs> This is not about other people. This is about how you feel about yourself. Do you feel like you're any less of a man because you have a low sperm count? Yes. Well, well, you shouldn't. This is a medical problem. You know that. It's like, it's like tennis elbow, only lower. <laughs> this isn't anything like tennis elbow. What the hell, you want me to rub some bench on it? Hayden, if, if I, if I couldn't have a baby, would you think of me as any less of a woman? Uh, maybe you're right, Christine. Look, I, I know you're embarrassed about today and you're afraid that people are going to make fun of you, but it, if you can just show people that, that, it's okay with you that it doesn't bother you, then there's, there's nothing to joke about. Well, maybe that's true. And that's why I think you should come back on the show. <laughs> huh? Let's really explore this issue. Let's do a whole show about it. You want me to do this again? <laughs> You, you admitted your problem today because you had to. Tomorrow you can come on and talk about it because you want to, because it's okay. I mean, we can talk about how we deal with it, how we're trying to...